Hey, hey, you're out in the garage with Easy Jeezy, and it's a cold one. How cold is it? Well, uh, left side is Fahrenheit, and it says about 25 degrees. And the last time I looked from inside the house, it was 18. I hope Rusty's doing okay out here. <clears throat> Looks a little frosty, but the sun is shining out. Oh, well, what's this? We got we got a little frost on the engine today. Oh my! What's this? Oh. Now, you want to know how cold it is? It looks to me like Rusty froze his testicles off last night. <laughs> a lot of people used to complain about the defrosters and heaters and so forth back in the day when I was using a Volkswagen went through the big D divorce you know how that goes everybody's got their stories and I uh, got into my sand rails and dune buggies living in a townhouse and it was tough but when I finally got the Volkswagens I had a house and I immediately put that heater that's up there on the wall I had that heater, I've taken it around with me, took it to several places I've lived and it served me well. The secret to having no frost on your windows is to start off with no frost on your windows. A heated garage always helps with that. Since our last video I've been fiddling with the carburetor trying to get it tuned in as best I can with that 009 distributor. A lot of people say there's a lot of good comments on that 34 pick 3 quick fix video down below. Uh, some guy from Germany left a comment and a link to an eBay site where they're making bigger 34 pick 3s. They're doing some work on the Venturis and getting them up to like 37 or 39. I can't remember what it is. Stock 26 or something like that. But at any rate, he said, yeah, the guys are hooting and holler over there how well they run. No more dual carbs, he said. But my way of thinking is you're only going to get so much. Now, this, this wouldn't be for a racing engine, but for a daily driver, a street driver, yeah, that's the way to go. These brakes are just working lovely. I'm so happy with the way these brakes, they've never worked this good. Cold, but the sun's out. That's Colorado. I don't know if I could live with overcast conditions. We're going to get a burrito. Mom heading over to Mary's house. Yes, sir. It's just been uh, a while since I saw her. I've been putzing around out in the garage. So I called her up and I said, hey, I'm coming over with a burrito. Start some coffee. So that's where we're going, to see Mary and Marley. It's too cold for me. Did I close that garage door? Oh my, don't you hate it when you do that? I don't, did I close the garage door? Oh, I'm losing my mind. How can you lose something that you never had? Better go around the block. <laughs> yeah, buddy. Got my two burritos, heading to Mary's. Yes, sir, it's one of those days. And uh, I wanted, I almost said Rusty's running good. This is Valerie. Yeah. And I'm telling you, these burritos were made by a little Mexican gal. And uh, she knows I drive Volkswagens. And she asked me, she drive the Volkswagen today? And I said, yeah. Mexican Grill, Tito's. If you come for a visit, I'll probably bring you over here. I changed, changed, this one's closer. It's like in the mid 20s. See, I don't know, did you see that lady just walking on the sidewalk? This is why I drive a Volkswagen. Doesn't matter whether it's Valerie or Rusty, 
Uh, you know, I hate to make this sound wrong, but it's a chick magnet. <laughs> I get more smiles from older women my age. They just love it. And, you know, kids point and they don't know what it is. I think I just started off in second gear. And you're in, yeah, I did. And your engine's got to be tuned pretty good in order to do that. That pick 34 is working good considering it's a. I'm going to do it again. Second gear. Ha! The only reason I did that was because I'm driving with one hand. This thing just spins down the road. It's nice and quiet. Hey, it's a winter's day and you're back in the garage with Easy Jeezy working on Valerie. I'm getting pumped up. She is running so good. It's amazing what nice brakes will do. I am done with using old hoses. In the past, if, I, if the hose wasn't cracked, if it wasn't leaking when I put it in, that was good. Just go to the pile, find a hose, and put it on, and there you go. We've had Valerie in the family for like 25 years, and I know my son's worked on different things on those brakes off and on, and so have I, and we've gotten mixed results, and sometimes I know it's pulled. Uh, I think he pulled the front beam out, put new ball joints on it, did different things, wheel cylinders, master cylinder, all kinds of things it, over a period of time. And each time we made a change, it seemed to improve whatever the symptom was. I can't even remember what they all were. It was his car and he was driving it, but it seemed like it was an old car and didn't have power brakes. So you get used to the fancy new stuff. And of course with uh, Rusty the Baja, it has bigger wheels and tires on it. And it's it's been pretty good. It was decent when I got it. But now I'm thinking of maybe changing the hoses on, on Rusty and see if it's as dramatic as this is. Because I had that leaky hose on the right front for those of you that didn't see that last video. And it was leaking. And when I took it out, I could it was all crudded up with stuff. So I put all new hoses on all four corners, bred the, the, it out, and man, I, it ups the confidence level of driving an old car like this. I, I'm not going to be on people's, you know, driving like people do nowadays with ABS brakes and stuff like that. People are crazy how they get on the, on the and, and folks see these Volkswagens on the road, and either they don't know what it is or they know they don't want to be behind one. And they'll do anything to get around you. I was, they have these things called a roundabout instead of a four-way stop sign. They'll have this little island and you have to drive in a circle and nobody knows what to do. It's just ridiculous they they started that stuff in california and they're removing theirs and we're putting them in we're still adding them it's crazy and uh i was coming towards this uh roundabout and here comes this prius and there was room for me to to kind of accelerate in. i was going to make a right turn and this guy was coming around the roundabout boy as soon as he saw Oh, Valerie, man, he stepped on the gas and, you know, ah, he didn't want to be behind that Volkswagen. That's the last place. He was in a hurry. <laughs> didn't want to be behind an old car. Uh, I was laughing to myself, thinking, boy, I'm glad I'm not in a hurry like that anymore. It's crazy. But I've, I've really been enjoying Valerie and those brake hoses. Uh, from now on, I get a new project. They're getting new hoses. It's just dramatic how big a difference that makes. And since I talked to you last, I went to the car wash. I cleaned up the underneath and the transmission uh, area. All that stuff was pretty grimy underneath. I have a uh, exterior a remote oil filter here behind the wheel. Let me just bend over. I don't know how much you can see of that right here. But it's behind the wheel. It's never been a problem with rocks hitting it or breaking it or anything. And I got stainless steel lines. It's kind of the old school Berg style remote filter. You get a little free cooling while you're over there. 
and I really didn't spray off anything inside here. It wasn't that bad, and I didn't want to get water on the ignition and so on and so forth. So, been tuning the carburetor, and I want to make a special note and thank you to the people that left comments on that 34 pick 3 quick fix video there's some outstanding people that watch my channel and I really appreciate the comments that leave that are helpful and informative other people will read those comments and hopefully take away something extra from that everything I told you on the video was accurate to the best of my knowledge and I tell you I was not anywhere as close as far as uh, the three turns out on both of these screws at one point this was like four and a quarter turns this uh, was in like hmm, probably a turn and a half I had no idea I'd been fiddling with it quite a few hours out test driving it and trying to get that idle where I was happy with it. Next day I started it up and it didn't want to, it stalled at the stop sign. It just didn't want to, it ran sweet when it was good and warmed up. And keep in mind I'm running a 009 distributor and these things were really meant to be with a vacuum advanced type distributor. And most guys that run a single center mount type carburetor use a vacuum advance and feel that it does a better job for him. Um, but I was trying to get the low idle and the smooth transition and I'm I'm probably as close as you can get with that 009 and the, those turns were nowhere as close to what I, although it started and ran and we demonstrated that on the car. So that's a good starting point but don't feel like you're just going to be, you know, an eighth of a turn either way from those settings and I think I told you three three to three and a half or something like that on both of them so you're gonna have to work it in it depends on your engine and a lot of circumstances another fellow left a comment and said I told you to come up to this and just where it wasn't touching and then back off the screw and he says you don't want to do that because then your butterfly becomes the stop and you will gall and get a ridge in there create turbulence and a problem with your idle and it's not good for the carburetor anyhow I wasn't meant to do that he said you should turn it in a little bit and I looked at this carburetor out here and I thought you know I think that guy's right you know you've got a you've got to stop here but that's for the choke and what else is there to stop it? A lot of things have a real positive stop. On my um, dual carburetors over there, they have uh, a definite screw, and there, this is your stop, and that's how you adjust the idle, but that, that's going to prevent those butterflies from getting messed up, like he said. So I look through these books that I have, and I use, I've gotten in different cars and bought them at swap mates and stuff. A lot of them were so old they didn't cover the newer vehicles. And I, I looked at this thing. There's conflicting information. In, in this book here you look at it. And he's got a screwdriver on it. And you look at the caption underneath here. And it says, idle mixture on three quarter pick 71 to 74 carburetors factory set must not be adjusted. And then... Um, over here they're talking about a quarter of a turn turn idle mixture screw in slowly until engine speed begins to drop then back the screw out one quarter one thirty tur one third <laughs> of a turn and that's the little screw here but it very misleading in that one here was a uh, one of those uh, John Muir books and he says uh, as the engine now idles and with the butterfly closed the set screw formerly the idle screw is on the throttle arm should not touch anything unless the choke is in operation it should be close but not touching as you adjust the idle okay and that is in particular reference to 1970 carburetors the idle is set with a fuel screw on the left side of the carb so that could be misleading that may be where I picked up that thought as well here's uh, now here's the same book as this one but I want to show you this one is a good book because in the back they have color 
wiring diagrams of many different years and styles of Volkswagen cars and these are so nice and easy to read very helpful if you're working on electrical systems or have to rewire a car something along that line uh, this book here was uh, said station wagon bus official service manual I thought well that's buses that doesn't apply to me um, then I got off track like I do even when I'm making a video and I started reading about 9-11's here's a rebuilding book they don't even go into carburetors there this is a fun book to read it's just about wore out I'm gonna get have to get plastic coverage for those pages and I don't know after that guy left that note I came in here and I looked at it and I thought look at all these carburetors there's there's tons of different carburetor models in years it goes from 68 to 72 they had carburetors on them the same ones as the type 1 right so I found this and it says to adjust idle 34 pick 3 um, you can read along with me and it says uh, that screw there is highlighted from this position turn the screw one quarter turn further in in not out in and they're referencing that screw right there so that supports what this guy said and like I like I'll repeat myself like I always do there's a lot of good information left in the comment sections under some of these videos and don't be afraid to go down there and look at them if you're looking for information looking for entertainment you know whatever you like to do I appreciate the support the thumbs up and subscribing like everybody's been doing I really appreciate it that the channels really picked up and I I'm just tickled to death and uh, hope it continues to grow and <clears throat> maybe it was the same fellow mentioned that uh, wouldn't get it to work right with a 009 distributor excuse me if I get things confused here somebody mentioned uh, a vacuum advance 043 which I believe is what this one is and I actually installed it and made a video and this thing was so crazy the way it came out I was suspicious that the pin had been 180 and I think where the vacuum pod was, you know, this little line, just like on a 009, should be kind of at the 4 or 5 o'clock position when you're standing behind the car. That's where you're uh, close to where your number one spark plug should be. And when you look at the down in the hole at the distributor shaft, you can see that this is off center and it, it should be closer to the back of the car when you're standing there when you get that into position and that will naturally put this facing towards that number one and this thing was completely out of whack and I thought well what the heck and you know it's kind of funny because people ask me where do I learn all the stuff I learn well when I have broken things and things that don't work right it's junk right and is if it doesn't work it doesn't work it's either going to be repairable or you're gonna throw it away and a lot of people just throw it away and I have a bad habit of not throwing things away when I throw it away it's usually really done and this is uh, uh, a picture you can see how the advance the mechanical portion of this advance works and then you've got the vacuum portion that connects up here on the plate and I learned a long time ago laying out your stuff in a something you can write you can draw circles you could take a flare tip pen or an ink pen and you can write yourself little notes about where things go and how things go you I mean you guys today can just use your camera take your phone out take a picture of things and uh, several times as you're taking something apart and then you have a reference to where things went and where the alignment was in proportions of different holes on the distributor and so forth this plate um, has a little bit of a bind and a bend in it and it acts kind of like a bearing and you can see that movement there as it goes back and forth it was very hard to move and that's going to affect your timing as well and I disassembled it and put a little bit of oil right in here this is like a uh, it doesn't push apart it's kind of like a swedge fit 
and it is kind of a bearing surface. It is a bearing type surface for movement. And as you're, every time you, you know, come to a stop sign and leave, this thing is, is stroking and it's changing. And how do I get that to move again? See, it's pinched up again. I'm just not holding that right. But at any rate, you get the idea. So I, I put a little oil, a drop of oil. I cut some of this lightweight Zoom oil. It's kind of like three in one. And I worked it back and forth and I'll wipe it off before I put it back together. And this vacuum device seems to work a little bit. There's a whole section in this book with a whole page of different distributors and their vacuum settings at different RPMs. It's amazing how they were fighting to get the emissions right, making changes on the carburetors. There's a lot of add-ons on some of these uh, later carburetors in the 70s. You know, 70s was a struggle, terrible time. 60s were great. It was all about 97 octane, high compression, go fast. The American manufacturers were making economy cars, but at the same time they were making the hot rod cars that we all know and love so well. <clears throat> but then when the 70s came along and they had the oil embargo, and a lot of you may be too young to remember or know that from about 1974 for about 10 years they changed the national speed limit to 55 miles an hour so it didn't matter whether you're on the interstate or where you were the maximum speed was 55 and that really sucked but if you had a little car an economy car it it was better for you because you know they didn't go that fast to begin with um, they went 55 quite easily, but as far as going 70, 75, where the speed limits were, um, that was, was kind of difficult. They, they switched over to unleaded gas. They took the lead out of the gas. The lead lubricated valves that did some beneficial things with your engine. They didn't have valve seats in the engine blocks in the 60s. They ground it right into the casting of the head. And they didn't have the hardened seats. I'm sure there was a few that had something. Volkswagen did. Um, they've always had it. They didn't have to make any changes. But when the unleaded gas came out in the 70s, the guys, people that put a lot of miles on those older 60s cars, the valves would quit, would go away. They wouldn't seat. You'd have to reground the valves, and there was big business in installing valve seats in heads because up until prior to that they didn't have them the head material itself was the valve seat and that's just the way they did things back then but you know that's neither here nor there it was just a lot of emissions a lot of things going on it killed a lot of horsepower and we finally have overcome that it it forced us to have the hybrid engines that we have today they had to become a more efficient. They came out with overhead camshafts. They came. They were racing engines. What you're driving today would have been considered uh, exotic racing engine back in the 60s. It, it, there's no two ways about it. With uh, variable valve cam timing, oh my gosh, what an incredible concept to put on a production vehicle. That, that's amazing. All the things that computers can do, knock sensors, fuel injection, high mileage, high horsepower, high RPM, and it still idles around and drives unbelievable. Unbelievable where we're at now. I, I, well, I started out in a 1952 Ford Fairlane, I believe it was. It had a straight six three speed on the column had a choke underneath the dashboard had an overdrive knob that you could pull and it worked and that was kind of crazy stuff but i remember my dad was really particular you know start that thing up when he's teaching me to drive you pull that choke out and get that choke in as soon as you can don't be driving around with the choke on that was a big deal and these carburetors were 
back in that time period and we had automatic chokes because so many people did harm to their engines by leaving those chokes on. Not only was it wasteful on fuel, it followed the plugs, it diluted your oil, washed the cylinder walls, shortened the life of your engine. And I know John Muir was one of these guys that disabled that thing. Uh, get it? Forget it. It did more harm than good for most. But I think he was in a warmer climate as well. So at any rate, we're putzing around. It's kind of a snow day today. I've uh, been on the phone with some friends of mine thinking about what parts I'm going to need to order. I'm thinking about getting a brand new 043 vacuum advanced style distributor because for Valerie, I want to test this out. I'm telling you, with this exhaust and th this cold weather, and one day it was kind of warm in the afternoon. I got it all adjusted. Then the next day it was cold, even though I started out in a warm garage and it didn't run the way I intended it to. But with a stock Volkswagen exhaust, you definitely know you're going to get exhaust gases crossing over underneath this intake manifold. And all car manufacturers then and now fought with that. Even when they had different styles of fuel injection. Right now you've got pretty crazy stuff, but all the ones that had an intake manifold or the injectors built into the carburetors and so forth down in the plenums, icing was always a problem. Icing and keeping that intake manifold warm was, they did it with water, they, they stacked them, they put the exhaust uh, near the intake manifolds. They did a lot of things. You need, in the winter time, you need that heat to keep that gas in a vapor state and keep it flowing. Because if you cool it off, it condenses and drops out. And then you've got a lean mixture and it just doesn't run properly. Not to mention, I even had a, a Toyota, a 71 Toyota with a 2TC engine and there would, you could visually take the air cleaner off and see ice down inside the carburetor. It would quit running almost and you'd just park it and let that heat radiate up. Go out there, poke it with your finger if you were in a hurry, then put the top of the air cleaner back on and you were down the road again for like 20 minutes or so before it would do it again because I remember that happened. And what they finally did is the same thing that Volkswagen did here. You had these auxiliary taps on both sides and this hose comes down and it draws air off of the exhaust area here where the exhaust, the muffler and the sheet metal down here would actually warm the air and it would draw it up here. And you have these little, uh, this, this side has a weight. I think this side over here actually has a little wire that you can keep it so that it, it always pulls it off that one side. And as the RPMs come up, that this is supposed to move back out of the way and then you get cooler air, more air, through these other nozzles on the outside end. And the oil bath air cleaner, although considered very messy, was you didn't have to replace the element. You just changed the oil. Um, it's very effective system. Air comes in, goes past the oil, the air has to change direction. The particulates get caught in the oil. And when you change the oil every 1500 miles, as what the manual said um, back in the 60s, that's all the longer. Did you know that if you had a, a Model A Ford back from 28 to 30, the owner's manual said to change the oil every 500 miles. Yeah, that was straight weight, conventional, non-detergent oil. And it would get dirty. They didn't have air cleaners on those Model A's. They didn't come with a Model A. They drove down all those dirt roads and did all that stuff. They had very low compression, like five and a half to one. And the oil would get dirty. There was blow by by the rings, even though it was low compression. And you'd just change that oil. And that's the same thing that the Volkswagen concept was to change your oil frequently and get that junk out of there. We don't do that anymore. It's uh, <clears throat> too many cars on the road, too much waste oil that would have to be recycled and we have better filters better oils and more efficient engines 
so that you can get more mileage out of your car before between oil changes. Although I would hedge a little bit just for safety's sake if I bought a new car I wouldn't wait 6,000 miles or more like they're doing now. So at any rate what else are we working on here? We're working on trying to keep things from spilling on our bench and I was gonna work on the hood uh, on one of those videos somebody was helping me with uh, the brake reservoir cap. Yay I found it! So many people thought that dark spot which is a hole was the cap sitting there but I had set it on the tire it fell off in the back and I'm gonna get it that's not the proper cap anyhow and it probably is a a bottle cap or off of a brake uh, brake fluid can or something like that so I gotta change that out emptied out some clutter I wanna get uh, into the wiring and put some light bulbs in for the dash. This originally was a 6 volt car. It's been converted to 12 volt. My son did that early on. He uh, pitched the interior right off the bat and put some kind of takeout seats in that he thought was cool. Those are on and I'm trying to get set up with uh, replacement seats. This is a 66 car but I think this setup is for a 67. That's the correct seat. But that should be on the passenger side because the back doesn't stay in the position because this keeps hitting the bump here on the tunnel. So that seat should be over here. And I think I've got something lined up for that. That's going to be great. Um, when you get winter time and you're doing your experimental driving, you want to take a coat suitable for the weather. So I've got a hooded parka in case I get out someplace and need to uh, walk home. Although these brakes are just lovely. Turn signals, lights. I do have uh, proof of insurance with me and I am uh, really enjoying the ride here. Uh, fun, fun. Fun, fun, fun. So, thanks for coming along. Just wanted to give you a little update on what is happening and it, if you need to go into different adjustments with that 34 pick 3 carburetor your car may need that so don't feel that you have to stay exactly what I said in that original video and be sure and read the comments from time to time because it might have some tips in there that'll help you as well and thanks to those people who leave those tips and give me the support that they do I really appreciate it and you can Give me another thumbs up today. <laughs> um, give me an inch and I take a mile, right? Anyhow, thanks for watching. Thanks for subbing. Easy Jeezy, out.